he, he can fight and he can punch. And like I said, he's fit as a fiddle. You know, look, if that Jake Paul fight comes off, I want a percentage, right? <laughs> I can reveal we have a new record holder. So if it wasn't for boxing, then who knows what would have happened to me. I was in, you know, I was in turmoil in a bad place and boxing saved me. Joe presents From the Corner, brought to you by The Zone. Hello, boxing fans, and welcome to From the Corner, the show that delivers round after round of juicy boxing content with me, David Alorca. And me, Swazi McCallie. In the red corner, we have a bona fide boxing champ who rose to the top of the game as the IBF World Middleweight Champion in 2013. And in the blue corner, we have a footballing hero who tore it up on the pitch for the likes of Chelsea, Man City, and of course, England. So, we need to make a lot, a lot, a lot of noise. Please give it up for Darren Barker and Wayne Bridge. Hey! Hey. Too nice, no. too nice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be discussing the huge super middleweight clash this Saturday at the Alley Pally between Daniel Jacobs and John Ryder. Plus, we've sent a crew to catch up with Jacobs in his hometown of NYC to see how he's feeling about coming to fight on British soil. We'll also be travelling to the home of the Romford Bull, Johnny Fisher, to see how his preparation is going for his upcoming heavyweight clash with the Spaniard, Gabriel Nguema. And we'll be spending time with the former light heavyweight boxer, Dr. Mark Prince OBE, as he shows us how he's been using boxing to turn kids in the community away from a life of crime. Now, obviously, uh, Darren, you, of course, joined the Zone boxing family yeah. as a pundit and a commentator. Uh, what made you want to get on board? Do you know what? I'm, I, I have to say, I'm living the dream. <laughs> I'm living the dream. I, boxing's my life. I, I've been boxing since I was that big. So for all of a sudden to stop, you really miss it. Mm. And then to get the opportunity to be there ringside at these big fights, I pinched myself. Uh, the Anthony Joshua fight versus uh, Usyk. I'm at White, the, the, the new White Hart Lane commentating with Roy Jones Jr. You know, I was starstruck just meeting him and now I'm sat next to him commentating. We're loving to have you just part of the family, man. So oh, yeah, well. that's huge. And Wayne, you're a huge boxing fan as well. I mean, how did you get into it? Um, I used to love watching it as a kid, you know, my early memories are the Bruno Tyson, uh, Tyson fighting Bo when he, uh, with it Bo when he lost. Um, Darren Barker. <laughs> Darren Barker, obviously. <laughs> Actually, when I first met you, was it, uh, was it the first time I met you for the fight? My first fight? I think so. I think, yeah, yeah, the first, yeah, yeah. I, um, I basically retired and yeah, I'm a bit of a, bit of a doer. I'm not one for like sitting back and watching. And he can fight. Yeah, I'm all right. I think I'm quite fit. Uh, I like to push myself. So I think I'm always going to have that, you know, since football, I've climbed Mount Blanc, done a lot of bike race and I like to push myself and test myself. And boxing is definitely one of them. When you even stepped in the ring yourself a few times, including fighting made in Chelsea, Spencer Matthews live on a BBC for sport relief. What was that like? The fight itself. I wasn't nervous, I was confident. I think once it got to the fight, I was buzzing for it. And literally the first round, I did exactly what he told me to do, which was don't throw too many punches, put your guard up and not take a few, try and get out of the way, but put your guard up and let him blow a gasket. And to be honest, you could see it after the first round. I think he just, he blew up a little bit. But I'm very, I'm a bit of, bit of a perfectionist as well. So I was a bit disappointed in my performance. I've done well, but I'd like to have, Moved a little bit, picked my shots a bit more, but I loved it. I do love it. I'd do it again, but I'd love to get paid for it. It ain't gonna happen, hey, is it? Hey, it ain't gonna happen. Jake Paul, Jake Paul. It ain't gonna happen. Jake Paul. Jake Paul. Wait for it too. Wait for it too. Oh, I would have. I love it. I love it. I'm hey, there. I'm there. For set. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey, we've actually got a clip of you training in the gym. Yeah, see here. My trainer's going, yeah, don't look too good. You don't want your opponent to see how good you are. <laughs> no, but I, I love the training. What are you thinking of that? What's he's his good. mood like? He's good. I've done some sessions with Wayne. He, he can fight and he can punch. And like he said, he's fit as a fiddle. He's got an engine on him. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, look, if that Jake Paul fight comes off, I want a percentage, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you 20 if you make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now, Wayne, um, you put yourself through something that most, um, even most fighters would struggle with um, as you took part in the celebrity edition of SAS Who Dares Wins. Was that one of the hardest things you've, you've had to do? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, I'd say. Um, physically, really hard, but mentally as well. Mm. I think physically, I love to push myself, so I love that part of it. But the mental side was the interrogation part. Yeah. And you just... <laughs> 
I can't really put it into words, but when people quit at that stage, <coughs> I think you've put yourself through so much, you might as well get through the last bit. But mm. some people just, they just can't hack it. You know, you're, you're stuck in stress positions for hours. So you might be stuck in one position for like four hours, <coughs> legs out straight, ha arms in the air. And what you don't see is you drop your arms, you get a little dig in the ribs, <laughs> get, get a bit of abuse, crying babies all the time in your ear on the headphones or screeching sounds. I think we only did, I think we we're supposed to do 16 hours, we did 12 because everyone was dropping like flies. Yeah. But yeah, that was, it's one of the hardest things I've done, definitely. But I, f I had more confidence coming out of it. I always mm. struggled a little bit with self-confidence, but coming out of that, I was more confident in who I am as a person. Mm. So I, I loved it, but it was, it was hard. If I had to do it again, I'd quit at the interrogation. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've done it once. I'm not doing it again. No. I mean, someone who's watching it, I, I always watch that show and it's the bit <coughs> where people are shouting at you in your face. To be like, yeah, but you only get shouted at if you don't do as you're told. And, you know, when you're on, no offence to Sam Thompson off Made in Chelsea, yeah. he just didn't have a scooby. They're, they're telling him to do stuff. He just do it wrong all the time. I'd just do as you're told, mate. Mm. And so I had that discipline. So I only really got shouted at once, I think. Yeah. So I think I've got that discipline, which if got me through it. Those interrogating me, old, you know, when you're a kid and you just like say what the other person's saying. So if they were shouting at me, saying, <laughs> "Don't look at me like that," I'll be going, "Don't look at me like that." <laughs> <laughs> I'd, just probably, that's it. I'd love to see you on it. I'd love to see you on it. I'm not going to say. How do you reckon you'll do? Obviously, Tony Tony Bellew um, um, uh, went through it himself. How about yourself? I'd love to be on there. <laughs> my, my you're issue, so angry. I'm so angry. I, I, I don't like being told off. <laughs> I don't react well to it. But as a uh, boxer, how do you deal with that? Because like like you said, it is part mental, right? Well, the best thing in boxing, if someone, if you get wound up, you punch them. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, yeah, the nature yeah. of the sport. But yeah, I don't fancy hitting one of them though. They did though. the boxing thing and he wasn't allowed to punch back. He just right, had to okay. take the punches. Well, obviously, uh, you made it all the way from East End uh, local boxing club to the top of the fight game. Um, talk us through the emotions of becoming um, a world champion. Oh, so, I mean, I don't know where to start. I still, if I'm honest, still can't believe that I won a world title. I remember... Being a kid, I, I just wanted to win a national title, mm. and uh, I didn't win one as a as a as a junior. It weren't till I was seventeen, and I, it, I, I, if I'm honest, I could I was content then with what I'd achieved. Like, yeah, do me so to then go on and win all the titles that I did. It's just incredible. It, it, like I, I'm still lost for words. I lost my brother who was a boxer, and it become very difficult to. Box without him. Mm. I had sort of a teammate. Boxing is an individual sport. It's quite lonely at times. Uh, so when I lost him, it, I struggled at times. And as the time went on, it was about if I can't do it with him, I'll do it for him. You know, when you hear of uh, a queen bee dies, all the other bees sort of don't really have a, a purpose. It was yeah. that was me for a little while because I'd achieved my life's work at such a young age. So it took a little while to, you know, with this commentary come around and it makes it even more special. Mm. Now I've found a new chapter mm. in my life. I can look back at the old one and say, wow, I've actually done that. Yeah. So yeah, unbelievable. Very, yeah, yeah, very, very yeah, proud. Sadly, all careers must come to an end, Darren, and it was a hip injury that yeah. um, eventually uh, uh, took you out. How, how hard is it um, of a decision to call it a day? Easy. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Uh, for me, like I say, being a young kid, uh, happy and content with that title I won to then go on and win a world title with all what I went through with losing my brother and my injuries, etc. Uh, I, yeah, I was struggling with um, my hips. I had two hip operations. I thought I had enough in that last fight to win. I generally did, but it, it wasn't to be. And I was in the, the room in, in the arena, laying down in agony. Um, Eddie Owen come in, my dad walked in. Tony Sims, my trainer, walked in. And I just looked at him and I said, that's it, no more. And to be honest, that I was in a lot of pain. It was quite a nice moment. It was like, mm -hmm. we've done it. We Absolutely. And um, Wayne, when did you realise it was time to um, to hang up your boots? Uh, just couldn't run anymore. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, there was, I remember the medical and they were worried about my knee. Yeah. And a few games in, it just, just yeah, just wasn't, couldn't get it right. Went and had a, an operation, uh, cleaned my knee up, but basically I didn't have much cartilage left. Mm. And just couldn't get back, couldn't change direction. And yeah, it was just- Was that like bone on, on bone? Bone on bone, That's the yeah. same as my hips, exactly the same. So, you know, it was, it, I didn't really have a choice. So that, that was it really. But I, f I thought I was ready. Six months in, I'm like, 
like, what am I going to do? Mm. There's always something I'm looking for. So yeah. if Darren makes Jake for Ashley, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've got a challenge. I've got a challenge, right? I was thinking about this. I want to be the first to do something. So I had this mad idea, right? So I'll tell you it When you shake it right now. I'll tell you it now, I'll tell you it now, right? So I want to cycle to Dover, mm -hmm. swim the channel, right? Swim, swim the channel, <laughs> swim the channel, out. right? Swim the channel, <laughs> then get on a bike from Calais to Gibraltar, cycle Calais to Gibraltar. So that's already a cycle, clock to the rocks, a big bend to Ooh. Gibraltar. But I'm not adding in the, ch the channel, right? Listen to this, we're only halfway there. <laughs> then we swim the Strait of Gibraltar yes. to Morocco, and then you cycle all the way to South Africa. Oh my God. <laughs> right, so I've worked out from top to bottom of Africa, it's uh, 5,000 miles. So if you're looking at uh, 50 days, 100 miles a day, plus another 20 for the other bit, 70 days. Got it? Well, yeah, I'd, like, I'd be up for it. Imagine like, that. Can you swim? <laughs> Not very well, but... No, I, can, <laughs> no, I'm good. I can swim. I can I, swim. I'd learn to swim a bit better. It does, it's just the fish in the water. It I will be like, thinking about the, the fish, fish all the time. No. I won't want any goggles. I don't want to see what's under there. That's the only thing. <laughs> yeah. But I, if you do it, I'm in. Now, let's turn our attention to this week's action on The Zone. And we have some tasty fights this weekend coming up. Sure do. Firstly, the main event this Saturday is at the Ali Pali, and it will be between Daniel, the Miracle Man Jacobs, who's taking on the Londoner, John Ryder. Jacobs is a serious fighter, having held WBA and IBF middleweight titles, but he also has an amazing story that extends well outside the ring. That's right, and we sent the Zone's resident boxing experts, Ak and Barak, to catch up with him in his native Brooklyn to hear all about it. What makes me the Miracle Man is the things that I've overcome. The man was told he may not live, he may not walk again, but he will certainly never fight again. You, you beat cancer and you came back. You didn't really leave because it was 2011. You came back the next year. Danny Jacobs, fortunate to be alive, fortunate to be able to walk, and now ready, believe it or not, to fight. People are a victim of cancers every day. I feel like it is my obligation and duty to be a hope symbol, to give light to those who can't see it at the moment. They told me I could never box. They told me I wouldn't walk proper, but guess what I did? I proved everyone wrong. He came back to win the World Middleweight Championship. One day it will go down as the greatest comeback story in the history of the sport. Yes, sir. I'm from Brooklyn, Brownsville, New York. I never, ever, ever, ever had it easy. Growing up in Brownsville wasn't easy, but it was the best. We learned how to have you know, that, that toughness, that true grit, but also, you know, you get a sense of love when it comes to uh, us not having everything, but having everything in the same token. From what I can remember, I remember you as a teenager, and I'm like seeing you in the projects, Coney Island training. I was like, this kid is nice. What, what is it about Brooklyn that makes champions? Because <laughs> <laughs> we excel in not just boxing. We excel in so many different areas, music, so many other sports, so many different things in life. Back in the day, I used to say it was something in the water, but <laughs> now I can attest to it as it's just the grit that us Brownsville, us Brooklyn Knights experience. And it's one of those things where you have to be growing up within that to be able to truly understand. It's crazy how it's all coming full circle. Such an incredible story. So inspiring. Darren, what do you make of it? Yeah, amazing. Uh, an amazing man, uh, uh, an amazing fighter, and still has aspirations to pick up an another title. So this is a big fight. It's an intriguing fight. John Ryder searching for his first uh, world title. I, I still believe he beat Callum Smith. I thought it was a very, uh, very good fight, very close fight, but I thought, one, he did enough to win. Mm. I know he's so eager and, uh, uh, to win a world title, so truly believes that he should be a world champion. So it's a big fight for both. It really is. It's, you know, uh, two fighters where, where does the loser go? Mm. You know, they're so close. Would they want to drop down a level? I'm not sure. So, mm. so much on the line. Absolutely, indeed. Now, um, also on the undercard, and that would be WBC international middleweight title bout between two undefeated fighters, Felix Cash and Magomed Madiev. 
What, what are your thoughts on them? Big fan of Felix Cash. Works with my trainer, Tony Sims. And um, he's just gone from strength to strength. Really accomplished fighter. Very mature. He's got this this fire in him, though, that when he hurts his opponents, he really bites down on his gum shield. And that makes it very exciting because sometimes he'll take one to land four. Um, but he's a, he's a very exciting fighter. Well-skilled and... Yeah, this is a good fight. I, I've done my prep on this. His opponent's dangerous. He's got a couple of draws, but he's unbeaten. Uh, he's well scored, moves his head well. Um, so it, it, this could be a really good fight. You, you talk about uh, banana skins. This potentially could mm. be one for Felix Cash, but I expect him to come through it. Uh, a big fan of Felix. Also on the undercard is one of the most exciting upcoming British heavyweights, the Romford Bull. I'm an Ilford, so this one's <laughs> extra, extra exciting. Romford Bull, Johnny Fisher, he'll be taking on Gabriel Nguma. I've been very impressed with the rate of improvement from Johnny Fisher, but I think where he's gone right is he's teamed up with Mark Tibbs, who I know uh, is a, was a very good fighter, well-schooled amateur, uh, and now he's giving that advice onto Johnny Fisher. Extremely impressed with how many tickets he him sold, and his yeah. dad sell. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. He's a great <laughs> character. Though, oh, he, you know, and I think Eddie and Barry Hearn have a real soft spot for him being from Romford, you know, stone's throw from where they're from. And um, I think if he keeps improving, how he's improving, mm. managed correctly, you know, need to take any stupid uh, fights at this stage. But if he keeps improving, the, the, the future is very bright for, for Johnny Fisher and his fans. Yeah, and he could make a lot of noise, you know, because all the heavyweight chat has really been around AJ and Fury, right? So how exciting is it for this guy now to come into the book? Well, look, I, I think it's about the next crop of fighters coming in, mm. coming through, because AJ and, and Tyson Fury, etc., they're not going to be around for, for too much longer. So mm. who's going to come through after? And then Wayne Bridge. Wayne. Yeah, come on, Wayne. Yeah, come on, Wayne. I have put a bit of weight on. Like, I would not want to take a punch off of him. Oh, like, he, like, he, he's obviously the expert, but yeah, I love him as well. I just think as a character, you know, all the interviews I see, and like, he's got a big following as well, like I said, selling tickets. Mm. I really like him. Well, we caught up with the Romford Ball at Mark Tibbs' legendary Origin Gym to see how his training's going. Uh, my name's Johnny Fisher, the Romford Ball heavyweight. Four fights and four knockouts. You'd have to believe that we are looking at the making of potentially one of the biggest attractions in British boxing. I've been boxing since uh, I was about six or seven years old. I've done it intermittently when I was doing A-levels and done a bit of university. So I went to Exeter University, I studied history there. Joe Joyce and his team invited me out for some sparring in Las Vegas and I couldn't turn the opportunity down. I still managed to come out of a 2-1, which I was happy with because it gives me access to all the career paths that I want if I want to go into anything after boxing as well. It was brilliant to be asked in for the last week or two of Tyson Fury's camp for the last Wilder fight. Learned a lot from him, not only just in boxing wise, but he had a lot of knowledge and wisdom as well. He said, trust the people that are closest to you, your family. And he spoke to me yesterday actually about my dad and making sure that you keep the people that have been with you the whole way, who are genuine people who want the best for you. He's got a great team around him, management, promoters, training team. A lot of hard work and effort goes into it. People just see the glamour side and it's far from that all the time. I'm fighting a guy called Gabriel Nguema. Um, he's a Spanish heavyweight champion. He beat the guy I beat last in my last fight, Alvaro Torero. And he's been in with some good names. He went the distance with Oscar Rivas a few years back. But I think my youth, my power, my strength, my ability will be too much for him on the night. Whatever the outcome, knockout, decision, the only thing that matters to me is winning. And if we keep winning, we keep progressing. Yeah, for what makes him special is his work ethic. It's incredible. He's, uh, he's very, very diligent. How I know he's a great listener is because he delivers. Excitement, aggression, explosiveness, that's just in my nature as a, as a boxer, as a fighter. Because I've got a very, very long way to go. And over the years, we can see that progression. I think we can see it now in the four fights I've had already. I've progressed a lot, but there's so much more to do, and that's the exciting part about it. Okay, guys, we're going to play a little game now. And for this one, you're going to be working together to separate fact 
from fiction. Indeed, we have picked a famous boxer and we are going to give you three accounts of crazy things that they have rumoured to have done. One of these stories is true and the other two are what Donald Trump would call fake news. That's right, our boxer this week is the undefeated Floyd Money Mayweather. But which of these three things did he actually do? So let's play a sense of rumour. Rumour number one. In the lead up to his fight with Ricky Hatton in 2007, Mayweather demanded that his pilot overtook Hatton's plane so he would arrive in New York first for their press conference. <laughs> You're laughing, but the other two get worse. So, number two, when Mayweather was seeking planning permission to build a home spa on his Vegas ranch, he bought each member of the planning permission committee a 24 karat gold Rolex watch. Number three, Mayweather once fired a member of his close entourage because they packed his luggage for training in the wrong Louis Vuitton suitcase. You know that problem when you've got too many of them and you don't have the right one. Two lies, one truth. What are you feeling? I'd, I'd go for the flight. I would, I would. Yeah. Look, 50 and 0, uh, super competitive, doesn't yeah. like losing. I mean, that stands out to yeah. me. They're all possible, but I'd go for the flight. Yeah? yeah. I can reveal the correct answer is... Number one, the flight. That's <laughs> it. Right. Well done. <laughs> Floyd once tried to get his private jet to race Ricky Hatton's jet to New York. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Ricky Hatton well, also recalled the story of his pilot intercepting the messages over the radio when Mayweather could be heard shouting this, overtake that mother effer. I'm the champ. <laughs> I've got to get to New York first. I'll pay you with Yeah, that sounds <laughs> like you. <laughs> That's brilliant. Cra crazy stuff from Floyd. <laughs> Now, during the week, we were lucky enough to catch up with the amazing Dr. Mark Prince OBE, a former British champion who is still using boxing to make a difference in the community. That's right. We went up to North London where Mark was running one of his community boxing classes to chat to him all about his incredible story and the amazing things he's been doing with boxing. Boxing is a perfect metaphor for life because it will expose your true character under pressure. I want it to burn. Now get your discipline on. This is about feeling pain and your discipline overcomes pain. You could be a little superstar just based on what you're doing and what you've allowed us to train you to do. Did you know that? You cannot look like Thor and train like Miss Marples, bro. Let's get this done. And my name is Dr. Mark Prince OBE. So I fought at light heavyweight. Um, won the uh, W belt Intercontinental title. I won the IBF Intercontinental title. I'm the founder of the Kyan Prince Foundation, and we go into schools to empower young people, inspire them with motivational speaking. Power, power! There's no power in your arms. Three, four, up, down, let's go. And my son Kyan was an absolute beauty of a boy, and he'd done so well in football that Queens Park Rangers signed him. Coming out of school one day, uh, another young man from his school was in an altercation. Uh, Kyan went peaceably to break it up. The, uh, the, the young man took out a knife and stabbed my son in the heart, um, taking his life. I had a vision of wanting to help young people, help guys to not focus on gangs and knives, but focus on their potential like Kyan did. Imagination is the most powerful thing that we can use to reach our goals. I believe he believes in me. I, he believes in everyone. And it takes a lot of weight off my back. It just made me go from a dark place to a happy place. We run a specific 12 week program. So we teach them about how the mind works. How do they deal with adversity? So we improve their mindset skills and empower them to be able to lead a life that they choose and they want so they can accomplish their goals, find their true potential and utilize that. Keep coming, keep being consistent and get better. Whether you're coming here or you're at home doing your bedroom and keeping your house tidy or you're dealing with your relationships that you're in, be consistent and be better. That's what we will give you. Just cause something don't feel comfortable, come back overcome it, become better, right baby? You know, how great would it be if fighters in the field that I was in was all coming forward saying, we'll give an hour of our time a month to the Kind Prince Foundation so we too could have an impact on young people and help to steer them away as they look up to us and what they could be in the future. 
the lifeblood of the organisation is people's donations. Because our vision is never to hear the news man or woman come on and say another child has been stabbed by another child. Let's go to the next level. That's what we're here for. He's such an inspirational guy. Dr. Mark Prince, OBE and the things that he's doing in and among the community, but with boxing as well. It's unbelievable, really, yeah. what, what he's doing and what he's done. And, you know, it's like I said, every time I've seen clips or him chat, it does bring a tear to my eye because mm. it's just, it's so sad, but he's doing so much good at the same time. Yeah. I mean, these people deserve medals. I was very lucky. I've got a, a very loving family, but some of these kids don't have that. And mm. uh, these people in the amateur boxing club are, are showing you something. Boxing teaches you respect, discipline, controlled aggression, all of these qualities that some of these kids from these hard areas don't and unfortunately don't have. And uh, yeah, massive, massive respect to Mark. You spoke earlier about the loss of your brother. Yeah. And obviously Mark Prince has lost his, his son. Yeah. And so did you ever think that grief and sport would ever go hand in hand? At first, it was a struggle. Yeah. It was a real struggle. Mm. And then, as like I said, as the time went on, though I couldn't do it with my brother, mm -hmm. it was about doing it for him. Yeah. And sport allowed me to do that. Yeah. Boxing allowed me to do that. It gave me the path to be able to make you know, my brother proud of me, to dedicate that world title to him. So mm. if it wasn't for boxing, then who knows what would have happened to me. I was in, you know, I was in turmoil and in a bad place and boxing saved me. Yeah. Before we get onto the headband challenge, let's quickly talk about Chris Eubanks Jr.'s uh, win against Liam Williams on Saturday. Uh, Darren, he knocked, out, knocked down Williams yep. four times. <laughs> Should he have finished him off? Would you have finished him off? <sighs> I, look, <clears throat> I think he should have, yes. Um, you don't get paid for overtime in boxing, so if you've got your opponent hurt, get the job done, get out of there. Uh, and I felt, you know, he's still gelling with Roy Jones Jr., the great mm. Roy Jones Jr., uh, but he is improving under Roy Jones. Of course, he went viral on TikTok with his dance moves, but Wayne, are you a fan of the showboating, or do you think fighters should just stick to getting the job done? I found it annoying watch, watching, to be honest. Yeah? I, I thought it was very disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Um... And I, I would have loved to have seen, seen him lose it and just really gone after him. Because I found it annoying watching. I, yeah. was, I was a bit disappointed in it, to be honest. Oh, wow. Is I it get showboating and that, but it was the end of the fight. He kind of knew he had won it. Just taking a piss. <laughs> <laughs> I'd want to just go kick him, elbow him. It really annoying, I found it. Yeah. I, look, one thing about Eubank Jr. He's a big draw, and it, it, it generates big noise. That some of the some of the greatest fighters from the past, Nazim Hamid, etc., they've done all crazy things, but it generates publicity, etc. So they're each to their own. All right, we are here for the moment <laughs> that you guys have both been waiting for. I've been waiting for, to be honest with you. It's time to play the headband challenge. Well, at the top of the leaderboard, you've got the UFC superstar Molly McCann, who's at top with 62 points. So 62 is the point you need to beat. Bring I've never done this. this. <laughs> There's no excuse. I've never done this. Uh, I, I Yeah, I said before we went live. I'm sure it's been an so Instagram long. video of you doing <laughs> it somewhere. <laughs> it, it's, sure. it's, been, it's been that long since I was boxing. We were catching chickens, etc. <laughs> that was the sort of pain that I've done. <laughs> In, come in i can reveal we have a new record holder you ready for this no. <laughs> <laughs> all, all right. right the holder of the new record which is now 64 is wayne bridge come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> we want to say a massive massive thank you so much for you guys coming in it's there and away thank you very much uh, remember to catch this on the Joel YouTube channel and or wherever you watch your podcasts and get them from. This has been From the Corner, brought to you by Joel and The Zone. You've been listening to From the Corner, brought to you by Joel and The Zone.